So I wanted to show a few slides just to illustrate the anatomy. And then Dr. Lisa Shea, who's a hospitalist here at Stanford Hospital, has been kind enough because she developed a benign goiter. And she's been kind enough to show us. Uh, she'll sit up here when the time comes, show us the landmarks and what a typical approach to the exam would be like. OK? So um, let me go through this and uh, just identify our objectives. We're going to go through the key anatomical features of the thyroid gland so that it will help you develop the skills to examine it well. And we'll talk about the, the, the must-dos of the physical exam of the normal thyroid gland. Sort of what are the typical steps that you would do pretty much in anyone with a complaint um, or where you suspect a complaint uh, when you examine the thyroid. So first of all, the technique is, are the classical approaches you would use, let's say, to the abdomen. You inspect visibly, vi visually. You palpate, and there are two approaches to palpating, and I'll demonstrate those. One is the anterior approach, where you're looking at the patient and you're standing in front of them. And then the other is the posterior approach, where you're coming from behind, putting your hands around and feeling the landmarks of the thyroid with your fingers from uh, your position behind the patient. Um, then there's palpation with swallowing, and that's key because when the patient swallows, the thyroid, which is adherent to the swallowing mechanism, as you know, will move up and down. And that is so key when you think you have an abnormality. If you have an abnormality in the neck, you feel a bump in the neck, but it doesn't move with swallowing, then it's much more likely to be a subcutaneous nodule, something in the fat or other tissues that aren't embedded within the thyroid gland itself. If it's in the thyroid gland, it should move with swallowing. It should move up and down. So that's going to be a key differentiator in terms of a neck mass. And then the turning of the head is very useful because when you turn the head to the right, you expose the left lobe of the thyroid much more. When you turn the head to the left, you expose the right lobe of the thyroid much more. So if you think you have a unilateral abnormality, it's sometimes very helpful to go through the same maneuvers we've just gone through, but with the turning of the head to the left or right. OK. Um, and then there's auscultation. Not commonly done over the thyroid, but if you see someone with a large gland, a common question will be, can you actually hear vascular sounds over the gland with your stethoscope? And I'm curious uh, in this room, how many of you have heard a thyroid brewy? Looks like maybe a third to a half of you. When you hear one, it's phenomenal. And it's not the same as a carotid brewery, because a carotid brewery you'll hear over the carotid. And it dissipates as you get toward the midline. And with a, with a thyroid brewery, it's right over the gland. And if you go up into sort of more of the carotid space, it will get softer. So it's clearly coming from blood flow to the thyroidal arteries in the thyroid gland. So that's another uh, very uh, important potential finding. OK, now let's first talk about the landmarks, because these are so misunderstood. Uh, and here we have, um, um, it, this is from the aviator. And the reason I'm showing this is you see beautiful thyroid landmarks here to, <laughs> to the right. And actually, this pointer isn't working very well. I'll use actually my fingers to show you. But what you see at the top of the neck uh, is the, th the top of the thyroid cartilage. So over in this area here, you see the bony protuberance, which is the, th the top of the thyroid cartilage. In a man, we call this the Adam's apple. In a woman, you can also feel a, a so-called Adam's apple, but it's typically more subtle in terms of finding the beak of the uh, Adam's apple. But that would be the superior part of the thyroid cartilage. Then the next bony ring would be the cricoid ring. And that would be, as you come down, about an inch or maybe two and a half, three centimeters would be the distance between the top of the thyroid cartilage and then the cricoid ring. Okay, And the cricoid ring is typically where the top of the isthmus of the thyroid gland would be. So the thyroid is a more inferior structure than many appreciate. We have our uh, endocrine fellows who come to clinic with us after they're board certified in internal medicine. And they often come in to feel the thyroid gland. And they're way too high in the neck. They're massaging the thyroid cartilage. And I often say the thyroid cartilage is a misnomer. Because the thyroid gland, unless you have a huge goiter, is not at the level of the thyroid cartilage. It resides much lower in the neck than the thyroid cartilage. 
So this illustrates the landmarks. This is, I think, from a Netter diagram. But what it shows you is the, the thyroid cartilage, where it shows uh, the larynx, which resides behind it, would be at the top here of the thyroid cartilage. It's not where the thyroid gland is. You go down to the next ring, which would be the cricoid ring. And as you see appropriately shown in this photo, in this diagram, is that the isthmus of the thyroid gland typically resides below the, the cricoid ring. So it's far lower in the neck than you might appreciate. And then to the side are the two lobes, or the beautiful butterfly's wings. The butterfly wings of the thyroid gland are lateral to that. Where at the top, in someone with a normal size gland, it might extend the, the, the lateral uh, wings of the butterfly. The lobes might extend to the uh, thyroid cartilage. Um, but again, the midline structure would actually begin below the cricoid ring. And the gland would flank the cricoid, typically on each side. So with that as a landmark, this is Kate Winslet who was with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in Titanic versus the aviator. That was a different Kate. That was Kate Blanchett, by the way. But, but the reason I like this photo is I saw this on the internet, and I thought, wow, this illustrates how a goiter is visible to the naked eye. So when you look at Kate Winslet here, um, you can see this structure here, up here. And that is the top of the uh, thyroid cartilage. Right? So I was saying before, that's too high. And this shows you, even though she has a goiter, her gland, at least in the midline, does not extend up this high. That would be sort of the cricoid ring. And then below the cricoid ring, we see this fairly exuberant thyroid gland. So if I had to outline the butterfly of her thyroid gland, and I apologize that this, this doesn't work well, I would go out here, down here, and out like this. Again, so she has a goiter, meaning a visibly enlarged thyroid gland. It does not extend nearly as high as the thyroid cartilage up here. It sort of extends up to about the cricoid, and then it goes laterally. So again, illustrating that it's lower in the neck than you would think. If you saw her in clinic and you were massaging up here by the uh, thyroid cartilage, you're way too high. And what I do in my exam, in everyone, is I map out these landmarks. I feel with my finger the tip of the thyroid cartilage. I then move down, and I feel I go through the cricothyroid membrane. That's the sort of smooth plateau where we do emergency sort of cricothyroidotomies if someone is obstructed. Not a good thing to do, but that's a relatively avascular area. Right there, your finger will fit right in it. And then right below that, I can feel the cricoid ring. And I put my fingers to each side of the cricoid ring, if I'm coming from the anterior approach, to feel where the thyroid gland would be. Then with swallowing, I expect that little bit of tissue to go up and down and strike my fingers. But this illustrates those landmarks. Just to show you some very dramatic examples, here is someone with obviously a visible unilateral goiter. There's some swelling, a mass in the left side of the neck. If you were to actually look at what's going on here, this is a patient who has a goiter, for some reason has only unilateral involvement. They may have, may have had agenesis of the right lobe of the thyroid gland. Oh, thank you very much. They may have uh, agenesis of the, right lobe of, of the uh, right lobe of the thyroid gland. So you see this left-sided enlargement, which uh, is visible to the naked eye there. This is now using the uh, posterior approach, where you come from behind, you feel those landmarks, and you put your fingers, usually two fingers, your um, uh, index and middle finger from each side, over each lobe of the thyroid gland. And notice where this person is doing, uh, uh, where they're feeling. They're feeling, I'm sorry. It's a function of the, the screen not showing. But they're feeling, uh, this is the tip of the thyroid cartilage. This is the cricoid ring. And they appropriately have their fingers uh, right at and below the cricoid ring on each side. So much lower in the neck than, as I mentioned, our early fellows in endocrinology are used to. They're way up here. You've got to feel the landmarks and put your fingers below uh, and lateral to the cricoid ring, not the thyroid cartilage. 
this illustrates, again, the coming from behind the, the posterior approach. This example here, the person uses four fingers. I think it's perfectly adequate and, and perhaps better to use just two fingers on each side, uh, index and middle finger coming around and touching for, uh, each lobe of the thyroid gland. So again, uh, we want to inspect. Half of the exam really is the visual inspection. What sometimes will fool you is patients, especially if they're overweight or obese, they'll have some redundant skin. You think they have an enlarged thyroid gland, but it's really subcutaneous tissue. So you can be fooled. But the key is to then palpate either the anterior or the posterior approach, and I'll show both with Lisa. Uh, palpate with swallowing, and that's the key. If they've got some fullness in the neck, but when you feel, you don't feel anything moving up and down underneath your fingers, then whatever that fullness is, is probably not the thyroid gland that's causing that fullness. Turning of the head again to expose one lobe or the other. And then finally, if, uh, if, you want, if you can, auscultate. And if you hear a brewery, that's evidence of a very active gland with high blood flow causing the uh, turbulent sound that's creating that brewery. OK, so now let me um, indulge uh, Lisa or ask Lisa to help us. And uh, if you don't mind, Lisa, sitting on the end of the bed, I'm just going to wash my fingers here, my hands with uh, uh, disinfectant. And so, uh, thank you, Lisa. OK. So if you don't mind just looking straight ahead. And what I'm looking for with Lisa is I'm looking for the landmarks. And I, I will point out some of the landmarks. So right here, I can feel the tip, the V of the thyroid cartilage, the superior part of the thyroid cartilage up here. And then I can feel right here the cricoid ring the prominent uh, ring uh, from the cricoid. And the first thing I'm going to ask her to do, and I'm going to stand away so you can see, is I'm going to ask her if she can swallow. And we'll see if anything. So can you see that? There's a fullness in the neck. Looks like she has a goiter. And what makes me more suspicious that it's really thyroid is I can see when she swallows that that mass goes up and down. If she had that fullness, and when she swallowed, it sort of stayed in the same location, but perhaps was pushed forward a little bit, then I would be more suspicious of something else, a lymph node, a thyroglossal duct, thyroglossal cyst, something other than the thyroid gland itself, because those structures typically don't move with swallowing. So I'm suspicious that she has a, a thyroid abnormality. And when you have an enlarged thyroid, it's called a goiter. I don't know if it's a multinodular goiter, if it's an asymmetrical goiter like we showed before. But a goiter just means an enlarged thyroid gland. So OK. And what I'm going to do is sit next to her. And what I like to do is first actually do the anterior approach. So I'm going to stay be in the front of her. And having felt my landmarks, I'm going to put my thumbs actually over each lobe, if you don't mind swallowing. And um, I hope she'll be willing to allow others to feel her neck as well. But I can feel under each thumb a gland moving up and down. And it's, it's fairly spongy, and it's fairly symmetrical, and it's fairly firm. Um, OK? Now, um, the other approach I could use is to come from behind. The reason I like to show the anterior approach, where I put my fingers here and put my thumbs over each lobe after marching out the landmarks, is when you come from behind, and the patient, even if they trust you, they feel you coming from behind, it can, it can be scary to some patients. And so I think most patients, if you give them a choice, they prefer that you stay in front of them so they can see exactly what you're doing, rather than coming from behind and, and putting your, your fingers around them. But Lisa and I have known each other for years, and she trusts me. So I'm going to come from behind. And again, I'm going to march out the landmarks. So there is the thyroid cartilage right there. Here is the cricoid, and I'm putting my fingers just below that. I'm going to put um, two fingers on each side, right there. OK. And now, do you mind swallowing? OK. Once more? OK, beautiful. Now, and it is hard for some patients to swallow on demand. So giving them a half a cup of water so they can have a little sip in their mouth as you come to swallow is very useful. So I feel her gland is fairly symmetrical. It feels pa easily palpable on both sides. What I'm going to ask her to do is turn to the left. 
And what that does is it allows me to feel the right low better. So again, I know where the landmarks are. And I actually like to use uh, three fingers. So I come this way. Do you want to swallow for me? OK. And I can feel that lobe quite well. And then if you could turn toward me. Swallow? OK. And now go straight ahead. So I could feel, again, the right lobe better if she turns to the left, and the left lobe better if she turns to the right. It just changes the position enough that it makes it easy. And then, although I don't have a stethoscope with me right now, it's very easy to have her take a couple deep breaths and then hold it. And then I will listen over one lobe. And then I will listen over the other lobe. And because the gland is typically quite small, I think it's better to use the, the bell than the diaphragm. But you can use either. And we've had cases where patients come in with, with uh, goiters and brewies. And you can hear them typically quite well with the bell or the diaphragm. So that's my typical approach. Just to review, it's very important to, to watch the patient and look at their neck and look at their swallowing mechanism. Second, it's very important to, even if you're experienced at this, and I've been doing this in a thyroid unit for actually 30 years or so, but it's very important to then remember the landmarks and actually march them out in each patient. Not be so overconfident, because some patients actually have thyroid cartilages that are remarkably low, and some people quite high. Lisa's actually quite high. So it's useful to take your finger and march out and feel for the tip of the thyroid cartilage, and then go down again about an inch or inch and a half, three to four centimeters, and feel the, the cricoid ring, and then go right below that. If you're right below the cricoid ring with your finger slightly laterally, you're going to be over the lobes of the thyroid gland in most people in North America. If a patient has a huge goiter, usually you don't have to march out too many landmarks. It's quite visible without that. But in more subtle presentations, it's really important to march out those landmarks. And I've had uh, even seasoned clinicians uh, feel that once they do that, they feel the thyroid for the first time. They say, you know, I never really felt a thyroid in a person without a huge goiter. But you can feel a thyroid about 50% of people. You should be able to feel a thyroid. It's prominent enough that with this technique and their swallowing, you can feel that little bit of tissue going up and down against your fingers as they swallow. OK. Uh, any, any questions or thoughts? Any other techniques that you want to highlight that you found useful in your practices that you might want to uh, disseminate to us? Yes. A couple of things. Yes. I've always told to palpate the carotid. And if you can, if that means there's a thyroid malignancy, I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, so that's a. I guess the berry sign or something. And the other thing is uh, when I'm doing the biomanual palpation from behind, uh, I usually have the patient sit in a chair and do it from above. And you can also look for exophthalmos at the same time because the eyes kind of project outwards. OK. We didn't talk about the exophthalmos. That's a good, a good finding. When you're sitting here, it's also an opportunity to look at the prominence of the eyes. Do they have a stare? OK. Um, and then, of course, when I'm looking at them laterally, stare is a little bit different than exophthalmos. Stare can be seen in anyone with thyroid toxicosis, whereas exophthalmos is really specific for Graves' disease, where you have infiltration of the eye muscles and the orbit is being pushed forward. But as you stand from the side, you can also see if there's any uh, apparent exophthalmos. And then there are little uh, uh, gauges we use to measure how far the eye is actually being pushed anteriorly that we can use to gauge that. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.